Mr. Drew Baird with FRX. Uh, I'll give a fun fact. I uh, took over Drew's role seven years ago today. Um, so um, but his fun fact is that, well, I'm going to give both, actually, since we got a minute or two. Uh, the first is that he started his career looking for gold deposits in nowhere, Nevada. That didn't work out. Obviously, he's still working. He must not have found much gold, so here he is today still. Um, and the second, as you may know, he is an avid biker. Uh, mountain and road, or is it... Mostly mountain, and uh, he's given up some training time to be here this week, so, <laughs> all right. Drew, Thank step on. Mm -hmm. All right, greetings. The uh, last, we'll see, uh, we'll see if it's least. That's up for you all to, uh, to decide. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm here to talk about treating low permeability sites. Um, I think many of you are unfamiliar with FRX, and one reason for that is that we're small. We're an 11 strong firm based out of the Greenville, South Carolina area. We do work all over the country, including Florida, but we're small and we're also very, very highly specialized in that we do one thing and it's all we've done since 1994, and that is what we call controlled hydraulic fracturing. So it's hydraulic fracturing for environmental remediation. And that term controlled sort of has two components to it. Um, number one is that it's based on a fundamental understanding of the principles whereby fractures are born, they're, they're initiated, and then how they grow. And that's, that's the propagation of the fractures in the subsurface. And what you see on this slide over here, this black feature, uh, is a fracture that's been created and then a trench was, was dug to expose that, and we used that to map it out, and we've learned a lot about fracture form, which I'll be talking a lot about, based on injecting, excavating, and mapping. Um, so the other part of controlled is the technique. And it, it's, it, as I said, we're, we've been around since 94, and these techniques are very specific in order to create fractures with this predictable form. And that speaks to the utility of fractures, that when done in a controlled way, that they yield predictable form in low permeability settings. And think of, I don't know, the Hawthorne. I'll thank Kenyon Howard for reminding me of the, of the lovely Hawthorne formation, which I do consider quite lovely. We like clay. Um, and that these fractures can be used to support a real wide variety of remedial approaches. Uh, whether you're moving fluids through the found, uh, formation, injecting bioamendments, chemical oxidants, uh, recovering groundwater, recovering soil vapors. Um, what I'll be talking about today is the use of fractures to in place or, or place in the subsurface uh, a solid, low solubility chemical oxidant. So these are fractures for chemical oxidation, uh, but chemical reduction is another, another means. So, these approaches or the, these methods are very useful across a wide range of remedial approaches. Um, I'll start though by talking about what a lot of you are familiar with and conceptualize in injections, I think. Um, and that is injection of liquid amendments or really any fluids, it could be air here, uh, for treatment of high conductivity zones. So here you've got a uh, permeable treatment zone at depth. I'm also getting mixed up by these uh, different um, dueling uh, pointers here and advancers. So you've got a high permeability treatment zone here with contamination moving from, from right to left from a source zone. And you've got injection equipment and crew injecting liquid amendments into dedicated injection wells. And fluids passing through transmissive zones is a very effective way to treat those permeable zones. It's been done for a very, very long time. But it leaves out a, a couple of obvious, uh, uh, again, I'm mixing up these things, a couple of obvious issues. One is that you have a residual source upgradient that may also be in low permeability material. And also, there's low permeability material, in this case, above and below this transmissive zone. And you're familiar with, I heard the term back diffusion, you know, a lot of contamination will absorb and, and diffuse into low K zones. And even if you clean up this zone, let's just take out that there's an upgradient source. Without that, you'll still have recontamination of the transmissive zone because of back diffusion out of the low perm. 
So the, really the purpose of the remainder of this talk is to talk about how fractures can be deployed to treat low perm with chemical oxidation, specifically potassium persulfate, or what I'll call KPS. So um, these low K units are where a lot of mass resides and re remain a, a big problem and a big challenge in remediation. And this is an example for a, from a site, uh, I think Jack, Jacobs for providing the data, but this is a well log from a well drilled in 1991. And you can't read, but this is all clay. There's clay, silty clay, various descriptions of clay. That well is screened over about a 10-foot vertical zone between approximately 15 and 25 feet BGS. And this well continued to have exceedances in these three parameters. And if those of you, most of you have seen this sort of spiky nature to time series plots of contamination often indicate a residual source area nearby. So an investigation in beginning in 2004 uh, involved a, uh, a soil investigation around this well MW12 to define this source of contamination. And again, though you can't read it, in here you get descriptions of clay, lean clay, fat clay, just low permeability material. And here's where the well screened. And note that you have notations here of petroleum odor, staining, and then again, you can at least see the significant digits here. You get from single digits into hundreds and thousands of ppm on a PID. So low, low uh, hydraulic conductivity, tight formation, high mass, and that was what was causing these continued exceedances in MW12. And the reason for that is pretty clear. This is from uh, Geoprobe's website, this image, and that's obviously tight. That's clay. And it's not trivial. In fact, you may call it uh, exceedingly difficult to distribute fluids in any kind of penetrative manner through low permeability materials. What can be done is that you can create a fracture that is in that low permeability material. This is lacustrine clay from a glacial setting in Ohio. And the top uh, core is from outside the treatment zone. This purple core has been turned purple because this fracture contained potassium permanganate and that low, that slow dissolution and diffusion over a period of months and years from the fracture is the distribution mechanism by which permanganate or other uh, oxidants can migrate lat vertically above and below a fracture. So um, we're talking about fractures and here's how the, the presentation will, will continue uh, to develop here. I'm gonna talk about fracture form and those of you who have seen presentations that I've given in the past, I, I start many of them by talking about fracture form because that is uh, a critical uh, component to understanding why they're useful. I'll talk also about the hydraulic fracturing process and then back to the slide that where the core was all purple, we'll talk about uh, chemical diffusion as a distribution mechanism for uh, solid phase oxidants that become you know, dissolved and then diffused in the aqueous phase from fractures. And then KPS, potassium persulfate. Well, I'm gonna, I've got a data compilation from six projects in five different uh, states and settings that uh, include uh, information like uh, productivity, and daylighting or surfacing, which uh, many of us have experienced that unpleasant experience, uh, uh, fact of injecting into low perm materials. Uh, and then we'll talk about costs in uh, these next few slides here. So the first slide showed a fra black fracture cutting across saprolite, which is weathered in place crystalline bedrock, think granite or metamorphic bedrock. This is glacial clay till and this material uh, is 10 to the minus seven centimeters per second. So it makes good landfill liner. And if you're looking at it on the desktop, you think, well, we're taking air sparge, we're taking, you know, injecting fluids or extracting fluids off the table because you can't move materials, you can't move fluids through this unless you fracture it. And the low hydraulic conductivity, the tight formation is illustrated by these steep sidewalls to the trench. And then it's, it's a little fuzzy, but you can see this blocky nature of the soil. That is low K, really tight soil. And so we've excavated a trench after creating fractures at about three feet, about five feet, and, and about seven feet BGS. 
And this horizontal white line is a string that serves as a horizontal datum. So t speaking to the form of fractures, they, say, they share similar characteristics. They're broad sheet-like structures. And by broad, think of their extent or radius to be on the order of about 15 feet. That's, that's appropriate for the purposes of the, of the presentation to frame things out here. Um, so they're broad sheet-like structures, commonly with a shallow upward dip, uh, sometimes very flat-lying. But let's just think of these as flat-lying disc-shaped structures. So I don't show a plan view, but in plan view, they're somewhat elliptical and irregular, um, but more circular than they are oblong ovals. Uh, so that's the plan view. And then the aperture or thickness of these fractures in this case, this one's filled with 2040 sand, and the, that's a centimeter scale. So these, the average aperture, you see the variability, but the average aperture or thickness of a fracture is on the order of about a centimeter. And so you've got this consistent form to the fractures that requires, the, that's where the techniques come in and the geochemical, uh, rather the geomechanical properties of the formation, because both are at play here. And the technique, combined with geomechanics, provide that certainty of form. And it's more than just advancing a drill string or geoprobe rod, for example, to depth, and then opening up a, a section of screen, turning on the pump until the pump you know, builds up pressure and then makes a crack. And when that happens, oftentimes you experience fluids coming out over here. Say I'm in the injection boring. Fluids coming up over here, over there. Those of you, those of us who have injected in low perm formations, you see daylighting, and I'll speak to that a little more. But this is what I mean, this is the result of controlled hydraulic fracturing, which again is based on fundamental principles and on technique. I have, I have some other uh, photographs. This will be the last one though. Um, this is that saprolite soil. So think of it as a variably sandy silt, in this case, mostly silty. It's weathered in place, chemically weathered uh, crystalline bedrock. These uh, lines here are foliations that represent the, the original fabric of the native soil or native hard rock that's just been weathered in place. And it's soft enough that I can just shove in without a lot of force, a 7 8 inch wrench here into the sidewall and uh, becomes a bullseye. But this still illustrates the form. It's a broad sheet-like structure, this one with the shallow upward dip. And again, that's principles and that's uh, techniques to create these kinds of, tr of structures. So let's, let's move on and talk about specifically how they're useful for chemical oxidation uh, when you want to place a reactive chemistry uh, into the fracture. So instead of creating a slurry that's, that's sand laden, creating a sand filled fracture, we're creating fractures filled with KPS, potassium persulfate, often mixed with a, an activator and often hydra, uh, hydrated lime. So these are a series of fractures, again, with a, 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 an extent or a radius on the order of about 15 feet. And think of them being approximately five feet apart vertically. So we'll advance a geoprobe uh, to the shallowest depth, create a fracture. It's a top-down approach, go to the next depth, create a fracture, and so on, until we've covered, sorry, Chad, I'm hitting you in the head with the laser, hopefully it doesn't hurt. Uh, there, there's a series of these fractures that, that uh, cover the vertical limits of the treatment zone. And obviously one attribute of these fractures and, and this sort of uh, slight upward dip and flat-lying nature is that they stay within the target treatment zone and don't climb out of them. So that's one of the utilities of flat-lying structures, that, that they do stay within the treatment zone. So we've created these fractures, and I'm gonna move on now to talking about a little bit about how we do that. And the first step is to create a very thick, viscous, solids-laden slurry. And what you're gonna see in the video that, will you all click it to autoplay? I don't think it'll autoplay, but this is an embedded video, and this is a slurry of KPS and hydrated lime that is about 65 to 70% solids by weight. And you see how thick that is, 65, 70% solids by weight. I've had clients refer to it as cake batter or uh, toothpaste. I wouldn't recommend, maybe it's a whitening agent. I don't know, that might, that might do okay, oxidizer. But this is one of the keys to creating good predictable fracture form is a very thick slurry 
that maintains its cohesiveness, not only in the mixing trough, which is this is coming out of the mixing trough and going into the pump, but down the drill string and into the formation and the consistency of that, the rheology of that fluid helps keep that fluid together and what you, what you uh, don't have is a lot of leak off of low viscosity fluids out into the formation, which is bad, which limits growth of the fracture and you screen out your solids. So moving on to another uh, step in the process is that we, we, have, we pump that into the ground. And when you pump a slurry into the ground, well, I'll back up, there are two ways to distribute fluids, and I'll include slurry as a fluid, into the subsurface. One is by passing fluids through mobile porosity, as I showed in that first conceptual diagram. Liquids or low viscosity fluids going through pore space. Um, the other way is to pump a thick solid slurry and the only way to move that through the subsurface is to create a crack. There's no other way to get in the ground because obviously that's not going through any pore throats. So you make a crack and the, the act of, of injecting this slurry simultaneously creates the fracture and fills it. So this, think of this as a, a tinsel parting of, of the soil, of the, of the formation. And it creates these structures that I've described and then we've got variable parameters that we monitor uh, to, to determine what's going on while we're injecting. I'll show you some of those in, in a moment. So back to uh, the lovely purple uh, permanganate. It's very illustrative of chemical diffusion as a dis uh, distribution mechanism in low perm formations emanating from a single fracture. So this is a CPT core that's from a silty clay in, uh, in Wyoming, so this is some front range uh, alluvial deposits. And this fracture was created, you see, you know, if you tilt that fracture 90 degrees, that's essentially a flat line structure. And one week after creating that fracture, you see broad diffusive migration of aqueous persulfate. So that's a really effective distribution mechanism. This is a fracture collected from core here in, in Florida, so it's coastal deposits, low permeability, not Hawthorne, but still low perm. And this is a potassium persulfate filled fracture, KPS. And it's hard to see, but I think you can make it out that the native formation has this sort of dark gray, kind of a charcoal gray color. And one visual indication of the distribution of the invisible or, or, or uh, I'll call it invisible uh, aqueous solution of, of persulfate is that right around the fracture, it's more like a grayish brown. So that's oxidation of the native formation illustrating s some distribution, the, some chemical diffusion going on with, with persulfate. You're getting an oxidation reaction there. So in concept, I'll just illustrate it with a simple set of, of animations. You've seen the stacked KPS fractures that are about five feet apart. And chemical diffusion just means that slowly, over a period of weeks, months, and even years, you get this, this diffusion halo around these fractures that are capable of migrating over, about, over a year, about one to two feet vertically above the fra each fracture and one to two feet vertically below. So, you know, part of why we can justify a five-foot spacing between these fractures is that you get that diffusion-driven distribution of aqueous persulfate, and it's matched to, in this case, hydrated lime, is a really effective activator in, in the sense that we know that it's chemically versatile, treat a wide range of contaminants, um, but it also is slow release activator. So it, it matches the release profile, if you will, of potassium persulfate, which you can think of as a slow release persulfate, and, and this is a slow release activator. So. That's the animations, dueling uh, things here. So we've done now, since 2017, five or six projects at five different sites. So I'm gonna talk about our experience at these five different sites and these six projects. And the first was a USD site here in, uh, here in Colorado. It was the first injection of KPS in, uh, in the US. Um, closer to home, closer to here is uh, our largest project. It was for 1,4-dioxane. Uh, you see the number of fractures here. And most recently, we worked in New England uh, to treat uh, a variety of chlorinated solvents with a little bit of l -napal. So I'll walk through some, some metrics that we judge uh, sort of the, 
the productivity, if you will. This, is, this uh, speaks to loading and productivity. So these are the projects and the dates. Uh, this column is the KPS, the potassium persulfate, and the activators. And you're looking at the dosi, dosing range measured by uh, percentage dry weight of soil. And one thing to note is that with experience, we've been able to increase that loading. And next year, we're going to come close to doubling this, this 0.72. We'll be well over 1% by weight uh, uh, delivery of dose. Now here you see pounds in a fracture, and the, and the largest amount is, is about 800 pounds per fracture. We'll, we'll be eclipsing 1,200 uh, next year. Gotcha, thank you. And pounds per day, this speaks to how much mass we're able to get in into, or these techniques are able to, to deliver uh, in, in a single day. So a lot of mass in a short period of time. So, I'm going to talk about daylighting, and this blob you see here is sand-laden slurry that's been injected at about 3 feet BGS at this injection point that's about 12 feet away. And you see this uh, crack, this linear crack, and it's erupting, if you will. It's a slow uh, sort of uh, uh, gel movement across the surface. This crack is indicative of a fracture intersecting with the ground surface. So slight upward dip 12 feet away from three feet BGS, you get a crack. Now that's unwelcome, we don't want that. Uh, you've, you've stood in plenty of uh, daylighted materials and there are reasons why you've done that. And, and an operational reason why daylighting occurs is that, yeah, I'm in Florida, this may be a poor example, that's a copper water pipe for you Floridians in the room, most of you. And in, if you live where it's cold enough for your copper pipes to freeze, that's a, that's a crack that occurs along the long axis of the copper pipe. So think of a borehole as a copper pipe. If you pressurize that borehole, the failure mechanism is a vertical seam. It's a vertical crack. And if you get fractures initiated or started growing on a vertical plane, you're likely to see a steep dipping fracture perhaps intersecting with the surface. So that's a common reason why you get uh, daylighting when you just use pressure alone to, to pressurize a fracture. And I won't, I won't go into this, but this is a conceptual diagram for our, from our counterparts in the uh, Colorado uh, uh, Petroleum uh, Management Program, where they've witnessed this, and this is their conceptual diagram of steeply dipping fractures leading to daylighting and surfacing. Uh, excessive amounts, amounts of this can kill a project. I mean, think of a pilot. One of the goals of a pilot is to demonstrate distribution. If you get a lot of daylighting, you're probably not going to proceed to the next level. And it can be minimized or eliminated. And one of those ways to minimize is to create this thick, solids-laden slurry that is cohesive and migrates through the subsurface as one cohesive body to create that fracture. The other is, is that there are techniques to prepare the borehole whereby the fracture will propagate or initiate rather in a horizontal plane. And once you start fractures on a horizontal plane, number one, it's gonna, the geomechanical property of the formation favors a horizontal propagation of the fracture. And you also don't need a lot of pressure. So you can't see from the back, but on the y-axis you've got pressure that's 200 PSI injection pressure, this thick slurry, this is time. And each of these peaks represents a fracture, and those, those cross marks are data, pressure data collected every two minutes. So you got a lot of data density here, and you see these fractures. And if you blur your eyes or just look from the back of the room, most of the pressure data for creating these fractures ranges between, call it 60 and 30 PSI to create a fracture using that very thick, viscous material. And that's very much technique. A um, little bit of daylighting statistics here. You see the site on the left. You see the injection interval. And I'll point out this one from 4 to 8 feet BGS. And we've got number of occurrences of daylighting, uh, number of fractures. And the result of that division is the daylighting rate. And you see anything from, you know, at 4 to 8 feet, we had four observations of slurry coming to the surface out of 40 fractures, and that's our highest rate. Uh, here in Florida, that large job, we were deeper, uh, and we only saw one uh, occurrence of surfacing uh, at that site. So very low daylighting with good techniques. 
Um, now we get into costs, because everybody's interested in costs. So again, these projects, this group of amendments, you see the activator uh, that's been used in a lot of these cases, hydrated lime, uh, the mass of, of uh, these amendments, and I'm sorting this uh, from smallest to largest by treatment zone area. And the cost, as you see, smaller treatment zone, high cost. So you don't get the economy of scale, whereas larger treatment area and a thicker zone in this case, you get lower costs normalized across a larger area. So you get that economy of scale. But with this outlier, you're still looking at 50 to $90 per cubic yard, which includes fracturing, it includes drilling, and it includes the materials. And talk to uh, Fayez Lakwala and, and, uh, uh, and company from Avonic about the chemistry. I'm here to talk about delivery. My red light's blinking. And that's good because I believe my next slide is uh, just the conclusions. But in conclusion, controlled hydraulic flat fracturing techniques are really well established. And we've now injected over 120 metric tons, about you know, 270,000 pounds of, of KPS. Um, and oxidant distribution from the fracture, there are peer-reviewed literature, uh, peer-reviewed journal articles about that phenomenon. Happy to share those. And fracture form is paramount, and it allows these, uh, these benefits that I've described, um, and we talked about the costs. You know, so far, we're less than $90, with that $222 exception for the small project, less than $100 per cubic yard. We can consider that capital cost, I think, drilling, fracturing, and materials to treat these low permeability settings. So with that, um, yeah. whoa. Uh, yeah. If you guys would like to ask you some final questions here, fire away. Mr. Taylor? Nope, he's, he's heading out. I'll call you uh, out. Sorry, Lee. <laughs> Lee. Lee. Yeah. Jim? Yeah, the, the question for those of you in the back, once you create the fractures, can you come back in, you know, a year, three years later to use those fractures again? And it depends. If we create fractures that are filled with sand and we tie those fractures to a well, then the purpose of those is, to, is often for repeat injections. For example, in a high concentration, high strength source area with persulfate, you do multiple applications to treat that high strength source area. So it depends on the on the how the fractures or what's in the fracture and how the well is built, but they can be reused. Yes. Any others? I got one for you. Oh, good. Uh, what is your typical, and I hate the term radius of influence, but what is your typical distribution distance from an injection point? I like that you differentiate there because yes. radius of influence of a fracture is different from the radius, the extent, as I call it of a fracture. And that depends on a number of factors, but let me give SVE a, as an example. So say a fracture, we, we've got an EPA, if you remember the site reports, those of us who are old enough to remember those, but it, it was a series of EPA reports that was technology demonstration, and early on we did one for SVE to demonstrate, okay, a sand-filled fracture that has a radius of 15 feet, what's the ROI? of that SVE system, and by vacuum, this was uh, Oak Brook, Illinois, so glacial till uh, soil, and vacuum was measured double the extent of the fracture. So 30 feet away, we were seeing meaningful vacuum uh, with a 15-foot fracture, whereas the control well, which was not connected to fractures, saw less than five feet of vacuum away from, from that SVE well. So, but that speaks to a, a component of what you're describing. So it, it, again, it depends, geology's favorite term, you use it, I use it, it depends. Yeah. But that's an example. And, and if I may, to, to piggyback on that distribution comment, because um, we've known each other 10 years. I used to work for a chemical manufacturer. We hired FRX to install a granular reagent at a project, project in North Carolina. Now we're friendly competitors. Uh, you heard us both use the term fracture. We do things differently between the two companies. Um, but the one thing that I think we commonly get question-wise or confusion um, from end users that don't have experience with fracturing or distribution of slurries is, and I, I mentioned it, I know you mentioned it, Drew, is the approach, right? The, it's not just the equipment, right? You can see, but the techniques, 
like Drew mentioned, the techniques that I mentioned, vastly different, right? It's not just the equipment, it's knowing where you are. I think the one site we worked together years ago, you had a notching tool that also helped with the fracture propagation. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth. They do greater distances than we do. Uh, we do micro fracture on a small scale. You saw some of the pictures Drew had, he had a much larger distance. Uh, the one thing I would add is I would add a third to, uh, we talked about moving through the pore space, the porosity. We talked about inserting, cleaving, right? I like yep. your video. You didn't have it in this presentation, but your video with the jello, that's a good yeah, one. Yeah. The third one is the radial co-mixing, right? Where you're actually, and I, I think um, someone used the term earlier, working with the formation or fighting it. The third one is that radial co-mixing where you are, for lack of a better term, violently thrusting the formation radially away from your injection tip. Um, that's the third way to insert a slurry, but uh, I think, at least for us, to kind of wrap up this ramble, um, is just to be open-minded when you, when you talk to companies like FRX and AST, to, when you're dealing with slurries, like you saw how viscous Drew's slurry was, ours aren't quite that viscous typically, um, but just be open, be, be surprised by some of the things we ask and talk to you about. Um, the design process may be a bit longer than you're used to, there may be more considerations. I like that you mentioned pilot, uh, that's very important, especially with a large site. Uh, and I'll close with, you blew my mind by having contamination move right to left on your second slide, which it, that just took me to a just, whole other place, because it always uh, goes, I thought we agreed as an industry to move left to right with groundwater, contaminants, and that, everything else there, so. That's not a natural law. <laughs> they I, move I, both I, ways. I, I like that you bucked the trend, so. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions for Drew out there? Any, any other minds blown? <laughs> all right, guys. Well, thank you, Drew. Appreciate thank you all. Thanks. And um, Gene, may, maybe have some final words there? Yeah, just real quick, I want to remind everybody, I'll get everybody the PDFs of all the presentations. We're going to compile the proceedings. You're going to get that along with the videos of everything. I'll try to get that out before Thanksgiving. I'll do my best. Um, Thank you. I'm delighted to see so many people still in the room. I, you guys are great. I should have brought drink tickets or something and pass out to everybody. Maybe I'll do that as an incentive for next year. Uh, everybody, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was worth your while, worth your investment to attend. And we will see you all next year. It will not be at this hotel next year. It will be, I know, I've, I've already received several comments. Um, I had to carry this over because Mike Eastman had the contract. And when I took it over, I had to do it here. So uh, we'll probably be back at Rosen Center next.